So Parker, which is interesting because they were so innovative and so strange and different. It, it looks it looks futuristic. And it is futuristic. I mean, even today, I still consider it futuristic, right? In, in a back to the future <laughs> kind of a way. But it feels and just plays like a normal guitar, which I think shocks a lot of people. Some people can't get past the looks to realize it feels like a normal guitar. That that to me is, I think, what like, holds people up more than anything else with those. They should have made a more traditional looking instrument with the technology. Yep. Because ultimately it's the technology. You know, people talk about stainless steel frets all the time, but I, for the life of me, cannot remember anyone using them before Parker. Um, people say they were in the 80s. I have not come across guitars that I've come, I've come across, no ads, no guitars personally that were stainless steel frets. Parker guitars were stainless steel frets just to solve a problem. It wasn't like they set out. They didn't, you know, Ken Parker and 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 uh, Larry Fishman, they didn't go, oh, we're going to do stainless steel frets. They just, they had a problem, which is they couldn't push frets into the fretboard. So, you know, they had epoxy the frets on. Problem is, is once you do that, you're like, well, how are you going to get them off and fix them once they get worn in? And they're like, we're going to have to find the hardest material we can get so they don't wear out. I don't know of anyone who did it before them. And to be honest with you, I don't know anyone who did it 10 years after them still. Not only did they do it, but he, so even if someone did it before them, here is the here is the ultimate thing that no one did. No one put stainless steel frets on every single guitar in their line. Yes. But at first it was just a knife of just a fly, then it was the fly and the knife fly. Even before they were bought and sold, they had a fly and knife fly. Yep. Every single fly and knife fly stainless steel frets. Every single fly and knife fly, even in the even in the 90s, locking tuners, floating bridge, no locking nut. Right. I like I, I feel like John Petrucci made that popular. Maybe maybe I'm wrong about that, but I feel like he made that popular, but that was already happening 10 years before it was happening on Music Man guitars. The way I think about it is if it came out in 92, 93, that means the plans were well in the works in the late 80s. Yes. <laughs> so it, it, it's basically an 80s guitar if you really think about it. Yeah. And it, and it looks like it looks like it. I feel like the knife fly is, is passable because you can get it in like a burst, like a like a, a tobacco burst. If you squint, you can pretend it's a strat and you can get away with it. But the the original fly, yeah, it's hard to not look like an 80s person <laughs> with that instrument. I got to see the shop and see them get built before they got bought uh, when they were still U.S. Music, which was the second ownership before I think Jam bought them. So I went to the shop. I watched them build these guitars. They gave me a little tour. I left to go back to the hotel. And I remember thinking, these guitars, they're not going to last. They're going to go out of business. There's no way. There's no way this is going to last. It was like, you know what it was like? It was like going to, uh, like a friend invited you to his restaurant. And he spends two hours showing you how he's going so overboard with picking out every ingredient and doing everything right. When I walked out, I remember thinking, these guitars should be $10,000. Because I couldn't mathematically come up with any other number that made what I just saw make sense. Now you have Gibson, they smack their guitars with car keys and they get 10 grand. Yeah. And it's Parker's crazy. like, I'm going to bake my, I'm going to start the guitar in a walk-in freezer and then I'm going to put it in an oven. And Right. It was like, and they had all these custom jigs and all these custom molds and all this custom stuff that they had to make. That was insane to make those guitars. Yeah. I mean, and by 2010, they were already like, by the time the Mojo came out, I'm pretty, well, maybe I might be thinking of the Max, but I'm pretty sure by the 2010s, they were already well into their cost cutting phase. Yes. That was well after Ken Parker was gone. And so it's like, he always tells the stories that the reason they went out of business because he tried, because he built a guitar for $10,000 and he sold it for two or 3,000, whatever the story is. I, I totally agree with that. The original ones, you know, yeah. this no, in, I, in, in the nineties. In the well, here's a little fun thing. I was a dealer for them. And because I was a dealer and I was the only dealer when I opened my music store, I was like, Oh, I want to carry Parker's like I, and Brian Moore guitars. Like I wanted to carry things oh, were yes. different. Right. So like I contact these companies and they were happy to sell to me. So I was like, all right, great. My logic was be different. But what I learned the hard way was which Parker was, when you become like one of the only dealers on the West coast, everyone who has a problem with one comes to you Oof. and you know, as well as I do, they can be as problematic as they can be joyful. Um, yep. <laughs> and one of the biggest problems they have is they can delaminate for the epoxy. The fretboards will peel. If you haven't seen it, you can always cut your hand open on it. I'm not sure how deep you are into the Parker 
nerdville online but um there's a guy interesting story a guy named v dr vj monzo um he he works at a university not too far from me and he has something called the guitar innovation lab where he does a lot of stuff with fly guitars like he he, he like he, he's been modeling them he did a 12 string conversion ken parker also has an association with that lab and there's a forum of people who are kind of like you know close to ken close to the university and you know who parker owners who have talked about the issues you know like these are the best years these are not the great years because it was sold this is when they were bigger and all, all of that stuff my understanding of things is that if you get a if you get a parker guitar and guys if you're if you're listening to this don't run out and buy the guitar based on what I'm saying. I don't remember the exact years. Check the forums first. <laughs> but if you if you get a guitar prior, to, I think 2021, I think that's the year. I might be a little off. But for sure, if you get a guitar from the 90s, those are the highest quality ones where they were really putting 100% everything, spending way too much money over engineering. Right. And the second the company got sold, like every, like, like, whenever other, like when every other company gets sold, they try to cut corners and they try to make things cheaper. And that started the slow or actually pretty quick demise. Right. Now, I'm understand, guys. I'm not trying to say that a Parker from the 90s never had a fret fall off. In fact, I know it has happened because people have told me it happened to them. Yeah. But from my understanding, it is far less common. So whenever I buy a Parker guitar, if it's not from the 90s, I personally just I, I don't buy it. I've probably had at least 10 or more Parker guitars and I've never had any issue with anything on them so far. Now, it might just be yeah, it might just be luck, but I think it also has to do with the years that I choose to buy from, which is 90s Parkers, even if it's a Nightfly. Right. And the older they get, the harder they are to find in good condition, which is tough. If you're on deeper looking for one in good condition for the 90s, I probably found it first and bought it. Just so you know, I apologize. <laughs> I do that a lot. I always tell people, uh, if you get fanatical about them and you want to buy one, buy one. But uh, unless you decided this is the greatest thing ever and you have some kind of weird call to it like us, I stay the hell away from them. They're yeah. going to be more problems than joy 90% of the time um, because, you know, they're they're old and they're unique and there's no parts for them and no one wants to work on them. Oh, no, uh, yeah. I mean, people ask me all the time. They'll send me like a specific one. Okay, I have this in my local shop. Should I buy it? I'm all... I, 99% of the time I'm, I say, honestly, if you want a very high quality modern guitar for four grand, because you know, that's how much you're going to buy three or four grand, you might as well get something. You might as well get a brand new Shore or yeah. a new Ibanez. And it's right. not because I dislike Parker, obviously, but it's like, it's been 20 odd years, almost 30 years. Right. And actually it has been 30 years. It's been, <laughs> it's been 30 years. Right. People have gotten better and you can get something brand new that's going to have a warranty that you can easily get serviced. That's the only reason why. If you are an aficionado, of course, you're not emailing me anyway. You already know you want it, right? I want to thank Dr. Andre Flood for joining me on this bonus podcast. I hope you check out his channel. I'll put a link down below. And I hope you enjoyed this pod clip as a preview to the full episode coming soon.